Welcome to the third lecture of the course. The title of the lecture is the process from scan to finished print. I have the same conflicts of interest as last week's uh, lecture. Uh, this lecture is a retake of the recorded lecture uh, due to technical problems of the re first recording. Sorry for that. So the agenda for today, uh, I will start with a short follow-up from last lecture. Secondly, we will embark on the process from images to a model. Uh, in the Q&A se <coughs> session uh, last week, uh, there was an important question regarding emissions from printers during the print process. This is an important topic that should be included. Um, here's a good uh, white paper by Ultimaker that goes into details. Uh, parts are specific for uh, Ultimaker and uh, FDM printers, but the, the general principle holds, so it's an interesting document. Also, the last lecture, I tried to give an overview of different printing techniques. After the lecture, I was made aware of this comprehensive overview of the different techniques. So this is for those of you who really wants to go into depth on different printing techniques. It's likely too small to be completely readable, uh, but more information can be found on this link. So let's uh, switch gears. So how does the referral process work at our hospital? So what we've done is we made it to the same system as the order, uh, or ordinary imaging referrals. So it's the same system when you when the doctor is ordering a CT or an MRI. Uh, we compile a short instruction page for the referring physician. Uh, the system is a basis for future accounting system. So right now we have five codes with different prices. Uh, <clears throat> And this is, the referral is really important because this, that's the documentation that the 3D printing engineer are allowed to go to the PAC system, which is the image database of all images in the hospital, and to download the images from there. So we can really document that we are part of uh, the process of uh, treating the patient. Uh, we try to keep the text uh, simple and talk over phone instead. So, um, I will also come back a bit uh, more on this uh, to lecture five. Um, for us, being part of the hospital has been really important because this means that we can um, treat, uh, we, we can look at the images without anonymization and we can be granted the patient information because we're part of the treatment process or the evaluation process of the patient. Uh, so that's been really important to have one foot in the hospital. Uh, for other that don't have that, there will be need for doing uh, patient patient identification. For the prints itself, uh, we are <clears throat> pseudonize them, so we can show them to other peoples. Um, so this is a system based on the initials, birth year, and the last four digits of the personal identification number, followed by a specific revision number. Here's an alternative approach that we do not recommend, but I, I include it here because it was, um, it really made my day when it came. So I got a text message and I was zooming in uh, in the picture, it was possible to discern that the patient uh, details and it turned out to be one day old baby that this was more heads up that in the future we'll make uh, a seat of this and um, a model because it was a really interesting case. But this is not ideal for um, GDPR and private information. But it, it made my, my day. So instead, we should use the um, referral system that we developed. In Lund, currently, we use either CT images or MR images. The advantages of the CT are the excellent uh, resolution and someone's somewhat easier segmentation. The disadvantage of the CT is that uh, it's generally less good for soft tissue and tumors, um, and that it's uh, an ionizing uh, uh, technology. Um, for many cases, you also need contrast agent, and uh, this could be a challenge uh, for some, certain patients with poor kidney function. For MRI, uh, the main pro is the, um, that there's no radiation dose, so it's completely safe. Um, there's a good soft tissue contrast, uh, generally at least, and 
especially specifically for tumors. Some tumors are much easier to see in MRI. Uh, a disadvantage is the poor image resolution. Uh, a bit longer scans for the patient. So uh, here's a bit on the sort of typical CT protocol that we use. So we have close collaboration with the radiology or other imaging departments. This is important. Uh, use the standard kilovolt and uh, current settings for the X-ray, uh, as we would normally use for the same uh, part of the body. We want to have it reconstructed to isotropic uh, voxels, preferably smaller than 0.5 millimeters, but at least smaller than one millimeter. It uh, should be reconstructed with soft uh, uh, kernel. Uh, the hard kernels tends to be slightly more noisier, and uh, it's not as good as, as the, the soft. Uh, both can be, you can work with both. One thing to notice here is that the reconstructed images, uh, image resolution does not change the radiation dose to the patient. So, and both standard reconstructions uh, that the clinicians usually have for the specific types of examinations and dedicated 3D printing reconstructions can be made from one scan. For pediatric images, there's a trade-off between quality and dose that uh, you need to discuss uh, with the imaging. For advanced models, um, you, you can discuss regarding acquiring multiple phases, for instance, an arterial phase and a venous phase or a late phase in imaging. This is for the models where you want to have um, arterials uh, and veins uh, separated and per perhaps in different colors. For the late phase, it can be uh, the bladder or the urinary tract. Uh, Eritrea um, that could be highlighted. Okay, so MR imaging protocols. So here it's even more important to really work together with the imaging uh, department. Um, for cardiac or thoracic applications, we preferably want to use white blood sequences because they are easier to segment. We would like to have <clears throat> respiratory and cardiac gated uh, scans, at least uh, 1.6 millimeters isotropic resolution, if possible. For tumor applications, it's uh, important to choose the right imaging sequence to uh, make sure they are uh, clearly uh, visible in, on the image, and that's usually the, the one chosen for the clinical routine. If possible, try to see if you can get isotropic resolution. Um, it's important to notice also that uh, for at least 90% of our models, the images were collected before there was a referral for 3D printing. So uh, most of the cases we don't get <coughs> specific <coughs> referrals. Uh, but for the really tricky ones, it can be really advantageous. Uh, good image quality can be the difference between sort of one hour in, in pr preparation uh, to print or one day for printing. We all also had scans that were so bad of quality that even if we did uh, manual contouring in every slice, it wouldn't really work. So it um, can, be, can be tricky at times, especially if you, with the low radiation doses. Mm -hmm. uh, other imaging considerations. So how old do you uh, allow your MR and CT image to be? So for pediatric population, they, they grow quick. Uh, for bones or tumors, they may grow. So it depends on how, how fast the bone growth or the tumor growth is. As a rule of thumb in LEARN, the model we use expires five months after image acquisition. Um, this is for adults and slow growing bones. So it can be much shorter in other cases. Another consideration is for bilateral limbs, so such as the arms. Uh, if you have a deformation in one, like the radius bone or so, <clears throat> should you also scan the reference limb so you can compare them and mirror them and plan for that. So everything is created at least twice. So this is the most important aspect of today's lecture. So. Listen carefully. 
everything is created at least uh, twice. What do I do? What do I mean with this? So everything is first created in someone's head. For instance, Sydney's Opera House was first created inside the Danish ar architect Jörn Utzon's head. Eventually, it was built in its present form. But first, it was a vision. So for 3D printings, you also need to start with a vision of the model in your head. So what anatomical features uh, that must be present in the model? What questions should the model answer? Uh, should you use transparency, multicolor, split in multiple parts? What are the su suitable cut planes to enhance uh, what you want to, to show? Because it's important to, to notice that uh, the whole point of making a 3D printed model is to simplify uh, the geometry. Um, so if you don't want to simplify, you can just look at the patient from the outside. So you need to take away parts and highlight them. Um, and which parts to take away is the most important questions. Uh, or rather, which parts do you want to highlight and show? Uh, and then communicate your vision with the referring clinician, preferably on the phone. After that, they have a confirmation that this seems, seems like a reasonable approach. Do the handiwork, so that is the segmentation that we'll uh, show examples on today. Um, this is the second creation uh, of the model. And then maybe iterate the digital model with the clinician and finally print, which is then the third creation or even more. Here's some hints or inspiration from cardiology, cardiology cases that we worked on. In general, it's important to get uh, the blood pool hollow uh, to uh, really show the, the vessel walls and uh, the myocardium and such structures. Uh, for some examples, I made the left ventricle wall thick and for others, uh, that has not been part of the vision or that important. Uh, the, advantages, the advantage of the thick left ventricle wall is that it's slightly easier to orient yourself in the in ventricle, which chamber is the left or right ventricle, um, at, least for, at least for some cases. For all models, uh, one or more strategic cut planes are critical. So that's probably the most important question is, first you do a segmentation, then you decide where do I want to cut this so I can open up the model to the clinician? Um, so uh, the examples for cardiology and, and the hints for inspiration. Um, some of the models you've already seen in previous lectures. For orthopedic, uh, pediatric pelvis usually requires support structures to keep them together. Sometimes, um, and here, here this is different support structures compared to the support that the printer uh, adds. So, so if I would print this uh, pelvis uh, without support structures together to keep it together, uh, what I will get from the printer is this sort of pile of bones. So here you can see the straight lines that are um, examples where, where I added support structures. I can also add the support structures here in the joints, uh, for instance, to ensure that, that it holds. Uh, sometimes you print the whole pelvis or uh, just uh, the, the part with the fracture, so it depends on what's important. You might consider including vessels to show the surrounding anatomy. Here's another example uh, where the vision was to communicate the re relation of the bones compared to other structures. In this case, uh, where the bones are in the foot compared to the skin. For uh, scoliosis uh, models, uh, the most important design choice is often to, to include the ribs or not. Uh, it can also be that you need a support structure that holds, holds it together to ensure how will this is actually uh, be able to print? Uh, a bit on uh, model scale. If you make the model twice the size, it requires about eight times the material 
and cost. Uh, most often also translated to print time. Um, we recommend to have either a scale one-to-one -one, uh, or a significant change in scale to avoid scale mistakes. So a bit on segmentation. What do, what do I mean with segmentation? So segmentation is the process of separating the object from the background in the images. Uh, and what we are doing when we're doing uh, 3D printing is we're trying to find um, objects uh, or, or segment out the objects that are interest. So those are the objects that we will print and highlight to the clinician. So <clears throat> there are a few selected dedicated software for creating free clinical 3D models. Uh, so the oldest one uh, been around longest is uh, Mimix and different uh, packages uh, by Materialize. You have Diacom to print by 3D System. You have Segment 3D Print by Medviso. Uh, so this is the software that I will show today, and I've also been uh, one of the developers for that software. Uh, you have software by uh, Scanner uh, uh, or PAX vendors. One example is uh, Philips IntelliSpace, Telericon. And then there's also open source initiatives, so ITK, Slicer, Osirix. Um, so uh, one disadvantage with the open source initiatives is that um, there is no um, support on them. But on the other hand, of course, they are uh, uh, freely available. Uh, another uh, challenge uh, could be that, or is that they don't, they are not regulatory approved, so you cannot really use them for clinical, more for research. Uh, some of the software uh, for, by uh, scanner or uh, PAX vendors uh, are also limited to uh, research uh, uh, questions, so they don't have the indication for use to creating um, physical models. Uh, sometimes they, they lack tools to include support structures and other post-processing that might be needed, so you might need them need to have uh, additional software to do that kind of manipulations. I will now do a live demonstration uh, on how to do a segmentation. Before that, I will show you a bit on the vision, uh, or at least the part of the vision, so I can uh, you, you can see what I'm looking at. So I want to create a model that sort of looks like this. Uh, I don't want it to do uh, the uh, thick walls, since um, uh, this might take too long, but to show an example. So here, let's go for live. So what I do is I uh, start with, um, uh, if I can stop my video. I start by uh, loading the case. So here I load the clean case. Yes. So here a bit on the uh, overview of the software. So, uh, to the left, you can see the loaded images. Here, and we have different themes, different uh, panels, uh, tool palettes. Here is the main viewing area. So, here we have a, a transversal view. So, this is a view that cuts the body um, in the transversal view. Here you have the sagittal view, so basically cutting through your nose. And here is a, what we call a frontal or coronal uh, view. So you can see cutting the lungs and the ribs here and the arms. Uh, here we have a, um, a panel where we can adjust the uh, contrast mapping. So you can change uh, how the image looks like that. Here's the mapping on how to map the intensities in the image. I will come back to that. And here we have show a list of objects that we work with. You can see there's objects as layers uh, in the segmentation. So we can combine these layers. Uh, the first thing what you do is we uh, crop the image uh, to only highlight the part that we are interested in. And I can crop maybe in the two different directions. Something like that. 
uh, now the cropped images. Uh, I want to make sure that the uh, pixels of the voxels are isotropic. So the same uh, scale in all directions. So we've done that. Um, now we want to try to show to highlight uh, the blood pool here. And so this is the blood, and here are uh, the vertebrae, so they're bright also. We want to make sure that everything that's above a certain uh, limit, uh, that's what we call the threshold. So that's a common technique in uh, image segmentation, to so take everything that is above a certain intensity in the image. And for CT, the image intensity is measured in the Hounsfield unit. So I can try to adjust here and say, oh, this is probably what I want to see. Uh, I check here in the different directions. I can use hotkeys to switch between the views. So uh, I will do a uh, thresholding. So now we can see that we've got a layer, and now, uh, a new object I could call threshold here. I delete the old one. We can uh, view how that looks in the 3D. Okay, so here we can at least see the heart, but we can also see a lot of bones and other structures we don't want. So now, uh, important thing is to, to get rid of um, uh, small parts that we don't, we're not interested in. Uh, we can also double check if we, we, we might want to do a, a small adjustment on the uh, on the threshold we had. So I think I actually would like to, to do that. Slightly modification here. Uh, so something like that. I do a new threshold. I can delete the older one. So minor changes. I see in the 3D. Uh, okay. Uh, what I now want to do is I want to get only the heart. So um, that's a common thing to, to get away of other other things. So different software packages have different strategies. Here we have one uh, automated tool that really allows you to point on the structure, and then it separates things that are not uh, connected. So in this case, it was really good. We got away most of the things. So already now we have um, something to start with. Uh, OK. So here, uh, what we want to do now, we want to then hollow uh, structure. So there are tools to make the surface hollow. So let's say one millimeter thick, and then we make uh, put the, the layer outside. Why? So we can see the hollow here. We can look at the uh, look at it in three D. Uh, so. So far, so good. Uh, what we can do now is we can start to uh, cut some vessels that we might not want in the print. And probably for all this uh, pulmonary uh, vasculature, I would probably uh, cut that away with a complete cut plane. Also discuss with the clinician how important they are. So now I cut a separate part, and now I only want to keep the, this part. So here I have a tool to keep only the largest part, which effectively uh, clears away the other part. Now I want to cut the model somewhere around here, so I can look inside the model and see the vessels. So we can, before that, we can orient ourselves a bit on the model. So here we can see the aorta, uh, and the aorta here actually comes from the right ventricle. So this is case this is a double out for a right ventricular case. So both the aorta and the uh, pulmonary uh, goes from the same uh, chamber. Let's see what we have here. Yeah, I put some points on the surface. And then I uh, want to create a cut plane that cuts uh, through these points. So, something like that. And here we have a model that at least partly looks like uh, our vision. And here we can see uh, the hole between the chambers. 
So this is, uh, otherwise the heart wouldn't work at all. There's some heart between the chambers. Here we can see the entrance uh, into the, the aorta. So the surgeon needs to put the tunnel uh, between this ventricle to the aorta and make sure it uh, separates the two uh, circulatory systems. So a challenge, truly challenging uh, case to operate. And the operation will also be performed uh, from uh, the atrial side, so the, the right ventricle atrial side, so, so here. Uh, okay, what we can do now, I can show you here. Uh, maybe I want to label this uh, object, so I can put some points here. Uh, to be able to put the label. Here. So I want to create the text along these lines. And maybe this was a Dorv case. Yes. Uh, so now I got uh, some letters, so I can merge them uh, on parts of it. I was, didn't look that good, but it's good enough for this purpose. But uh, I would probably redo it with some smoothing uh, to get the nicer uh, text. Okay, uh, we can take uh, another case to show some other uh, examples of the possible ways of doing segmentation. So, okay, we can close here. We can load uh, this case, aortic coarctation, yes. So this is an aortic coarctation. Uh, what I will do here is I will uh, delete all segmentations so we start completely from, the, from scratch. We split, we switch to the 3D printing uh, view again and get our standardized views. First we adjust the contrast a bit, so we get, so here, we can first see if we get, so here we can see actually the, the narrowing of the aorta. So the vision here is to create a segmentation of, of only the aorta, and then we want to cut it uh, in half, so I can really show uh, the narrowing inside and see how it looks. Uh, for a possible discussion on if it should be widened or not. Uh, so again, what I start with is uh, cropping. So we only need, actually, only need this part. Um, yes, um, we will adjust the threshold here, or actually we can use Contrast enhanced vessels and see. Slight modification, yes, something like that. Uh, okay, <clears throat> now we'll use a tool that allows me to draw a segmentation in 3D. So I can basically start off my uh, drawing like this. You can see it, it draws in all three dimensions at the same time. So I can you continue work here in small sections. We can actually at the same time have a 3D view on it. We undo that. And here you can see it leaks out, so this is not actually a, a part of the vessel. We can see it here, something attached here. So I can uh, just click here and then can say right click to get away this part. Uh, undo. I should have done, here's it selection, I think I can do it in 2D, 3D, so let's do it in 3D. So get away there. 
probably switch so I can see only uh, one view, but makes it easier for me to uh, continue the drawing process. Okay, see how it looks in 3D, yes. Um, again, I would like to make this hollow. Uh, put it outside. So let's apply that. Uh, now I want to cut, uh, so I can see this in our way. Uh, so we want to cut it, uh, let's cut it here. So I put some points. So, uh, so that's one part of, of uh, what I cut away. I can also get the other part and uh, see it from the other side. Uh, and here we can actually see the the um, uh, collateral vessels. So what happens in this patient is that you get um, this is so much tightening here, so it, the blood shunts and goes into the aorta back again with the, in these collaterals. So they can be also important to see uh, if we want to put the stand something here so that ensure that they are not um, uh, in the way as well. So uh, these are some examples on the, the possibilities of, of the segmentation uh, software. Uh, and this is just an example of one of the possible segmentation softwares. Uh, in principle, they are quite similar. Um, by um, going for intensities and working with that and, and try to split away things and cut uh, parts. Uh, but they all have different techniques and often it takes some time to learn a software. Uh, so which technique should you use in certain uh, cases? That's really important to, to work on and, and continue to learn. So let's uh, switch back to the presentation. It might be enough with visualization using VR or augmented reality. And um, maybe you don't need to print all of them. And which use case scenarios when this is better or at least sufficient is an open research question. So that's something that we, we, we would least, at least would like to go into more in depth and investigate. And I think really it's, uh, we will see a combination of just visualization and uh, printing. So a bit on the printing and post-processing. Uh, from the segmentation I did, it's really easy to export uh, uh, the model file, and so, which is usually in the file format called SDL. Now to load this SDL file in the printer is a bit depending on the printer, but many just put in the USB stick in, or you can use uh, Wi-Fi to print directly. Uh, if you have multicolor or multi-material prints, uh, usually each color uh, or material is often made as a separate STL file. Uh, I need to correct myself here also. Uh, it's not the STL file that you put into the printer. So you put the STL file into your software that slices uh, the print uh, into layers. And that software then creates a file which is then loaded to the printer. And some slicing software is allowed to send the print directly from the slicing software. Uh, in the post-processing procedure, uh, we, I really would like to, to try to include the measures for quality control. Uh, so for instance, for molds that we print, we also include the printed implant to ensure it's a snug fit. Maybe if you have some fixed instances in your uh, printed part, so you can check that those distances are still correct after the print. Uh, here's really important to consider implementing a procedure where the user signs off a final model when, there's, when they get it in their hands and they print it, that this model is actually acceptable uh, to the user's needs. 
it's time for questions and answers. Uh, so if you could moderate that, please, Philip. Yes, there is a question from Vasilis. How do you handle personal information and personal numbers if you send SMS, GDPR? Uh, yes, uh, that part was maybe a bit unclear uh, in the presentation, but uh, we we don't want our uh, clinicians to send text messages. That uh, that was more of a funny episode that uh, should be avoided. So it's not the ideal sol solution. Yes, uh, Liu asks, uh, have you considered orthodontic CBCT, especially for high risk bone models? Uh, yes. <clears throat> So absolutely, and the software uh, supports that. So uh, for that respect, uh, it's I, I treat it as basically the same as, as CT. So uh, cone being CT is definitely something that uh, you should use for, for the higher resolution uh, in that areas. Yes. Uh, Misha asks, uh, which softwares allows you to create PDFs that you can interact with? Uh, so there are several softwares that allows that. Um, I am not 100% sure which ones. Uh, the ones I know about is uh, in Philips IntelliSpace and uh, TerraRecon. I think also Mimix allows that. Uh, it's, a, it's a feature that we are looking into add to um, segment uh, 3D print. Um, however, I think 3D uh, PDFs is not only the only future format. Uh, we are currently using, we import it into other softwares and make virtual models that the users can get on the computer or the new iOS uh, for uh, Apple phones and iPads. They have an inbuilt version of, um, of this so you can actually send the link uh, to a model directly to the user and then they can directly place uh, an augmented reality version of it on the table and rotate that. So this is going to be exciting to see which formats will be used in the future. But definitely there will be uh, a usage of 3D formats that you can take the models apart and see preview of them before they're printed. Yeah, I think that's a very good thing to do that you can send the uh, models to the clinicians so they can get the approval before you send it to the printer. Exactly, so that's, that should be part of the, of, of the workflow uh, that you build up to have these kind of systems. Yes. Uh, Camilla asks, can you select what you want by choosing density? Like if you would like to remove, remove everything that is fat and have density that is negative, can one do this? Uh, yes, uh, I did not show that in the presentation, uh, but you can, for instance, um, select, uh, make this uh, the curve negative so the slope is sort of the other way around, and so from this to this, uh, to take negative. In, and the one typical application uh, that I use it, besides, for instance, fat, is to get uh, the the, the um, trachea uh, to do such segmentation. Uh, and sometimes I only, if I only want to put contrast enhanced uh, vessels, I use a sort of a Gaussian shape that looks a bit, a bit like this. Uh, uh, to only take those parts. So it's, it's really something that you work iteratively under when working with the segmentation to change uh, during the course. And you can create one object with one uh, threshold, another object with another threshold, and then you can merge these two objects or subtract them. <clears throat> so there are a lot of different ways of working with this. And um, with, I will show you more examples throughout the course. Yeah, and there was also a follow-up question from Camilla. Uh, how does that work with the sequences in MRI, if there is an easy way to answer that? Uh, yes, so MRI, uh, as I said in, in, in the presentation, that it's that's more challenging. And the, the, the real challenge with that is that all intensities are relative, so there's no fixed uh, um, thresholds. So what you typically do is you, you work case, case by case and adjust and see visually how does it look. Uh, one challenge in some MR sequences is that um, the coil sensitivity or other things may, be, may make it so that one part of the image is brighter than another. So that could be a part of what you could discuss with the uh, imaging, um, uh, during the, for the imaging, 
that there are ways of compensating for that during the imaging with uh, coil sensitivity mapping, or if you have sense, you sense the image, uh, but you put the sense factor to one, uh, could be one thing of avoiding those sort of gradient of intensities in the image. But MR is more challenging, definitely. Yes, uh, Daniel asks, what are the main differences between the three different software packages? What does it cost? How long does it take to, to uh, learn segment 3D print software? And are there any training courses available? Okay, so <coughs> several questions at one. Um, I try to ask the first one, so what, what are the main differences? Um, the Mimic software is the one that's been around the longest. Um, and essentially all three of the, the clinical ones, they, they attempt to solve the same thing. Um, and they have different degrees of automation. Uh, I think they are quite much the same in that sense, but they have all different ways of solving it. Uh, so I would be probably quite biased if going to, into details exactly. Um, Cost-wise, uh, there's a different cost on them. The, the uh, Mimix and uh, Dicom to print is more expensive. Um, so they cost maybe twice uh, of the segment 3D print. Uh, you also asked about the segment 3D print cost. And that's uh, the clinical version is uh, currently 9,000 euros uh, plus uh, the next year uh, 2,000 euros yearly as a maintenance. And then also, there are also possible to have floating licenses, etc. But it's best to discuss uh, directly with the company with Viso for that. Uh, then it was also a question on uh, how to learn the software. And I think that's the common with all of these softwares is that uh, there's a learning curve, uh, especially it's about learning which tools to use in which uh, instances. So if you have one particular problem uh, or challenge that you want to uh, do, uh, which tool are the best for, your, your, for this patient? So that's the hardest thing to learn. Uh, I do not know how, how materialized and icon to print do in these cases. For segment 3D print, uh, we always have um, user meetings, uh, personal meetings uh, by Zoom to teach uh, how to get started and, uh, and if there are difficult, difficult cases, we, we do them together to, to show. Uh, so there are definitely ways of getting to learn, uh, learn it. Uh, part of this course will also be that some of the case examples you will see how to do segmentations, etc. So it's one way, of, but uh, there are many po possibilities to learn softwares. Uh, but you really only learn, I think, by really having your own cases to do. That's when you're really forced to uh, do it hands-on, which is important to get. Did I miss I any guess. part of the question? Yes, uh, did you answer the part about are there any training courses available? Um, only partly. So this course could be seen as one of them. Um, and uh, one might consider having dedicated training courses. But otherwise, I think doing it together with uh, the user's cases is the best. So one-to-one -one, uh, things uh, which are included in, in, in the price of, of the software is the way to go also. So a combination. Yes, uh, so that answers everything, I think. Uh, Luve asks, uh, we have used some of the open source options and a dental planning software for segmentation, but this software seems to have it all. What does it cost? Uh, okay, so that uh, was part of Daniel's question, so um, I think I already answered that. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, Daniel also asks, what type of printing processes do you normally use for these scans you have showcased? Uh, so what I showcased today was um, uh, two cardiac cases. Uh, for cardiac cases, we typically use the Formlabs printer. Um, either we print it in uh, elastic, uh, typically for the, for the cardiac models where the surgeons want to really feel and squeeze and turn and a bit and that, so we use elastic for that. Um, Otherwise, for, for, for bigger grown-up uh, hearts, sometimes we use um, 
clear and to get it transparent. Um, and for the aortic case, uh, case, I would probably also print it in um, either clear or yes, the color material. Uh, so form labs is one of the most open often for for um, uh, cardiac. Uh, for orthopedics, it's more we use much more of um, FDM printing there. Uh, they also get a really nice surface uh, that's good enough for for those applications. Yeah, it's basically a question about uh, how many do you need colors? Do you need multiple colors? Uh, the size of the model. If the size of the model is bigger than the Formlabs printer, we have to print it in uh, the FDM printers. Uh, but uh, if we want really nice uh, surface quality, we prefer to use the SLA printers. Uh, so uh, Gabriel asks, uh, is there any risk of model errors when slicing a 3D model from finished STL to G-code? Uh, yes, uh, so um, good good question and I also almost forgot that in, in the lecture um, that after you get the model you need to slice it. Uh, in principle for bigger uh, structures, no, there's no risk of that. For very, very small details, uh, for especially for FDM, it could be a possibility. Uh, I would be more worried about um, things that are actually printed, uh, but then they are not well attached, so, so they fall off from the print uh, when, you, when you're cleaning it. Uh, or uh, So that's more of, a, of an issue. Um, if you want to be really sure, and I really recommend that to in the slicer software, there's always a, a way that you can simulate your print, so you can you know, really see how the printer builds the print like this. And then you can see uh, what kind of layers does it add, does it add support structures, uh, are the overhangs, so you get the quality information before you start to print, so that's really handy. Uh, but I would be most worried about small things falling off. Uh, and, and Sometimes that's not the problem if you have a papillary muscle that falls off or so. If that's not the critical part of the print, then you just need to discuss with the, with the clinicians using them all that. This is the case and uh, most likely it doesn't really matter because it's just to show the, the gross anatomy. Yeah. But in, in the specific regions, you really need to be picky and that's the model of interest. Yeah, we had a uh, patient that had a large tumor in the scapula and uh, during the printing some of the ribs on the uh, failed on the model but since the ribs weren't that really critical for the for the print we actually the the clinician was actually satisfied with the results yeah, even though uh, the ribs fall, fell off and so finn has a question uh, have you any ideas on how clinicians could can uh, or use interact with AR slash VR models. Uh, one interesting application would be com complex fractures for fracture characterization and surgical planning. Uh, yes, uh, very relevant question. And um, I would say that this is a really open research question that we should have more research, um, do, do more research, research in to, 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 to see how the AR or uh, VR applications uh, should be used. We have tested some of VR applications, um, but it was just test of proof of concept. Can we load the data into those systems? So I, I would like to write more uh, more here on, on doing this um, and try to actually structure research questions on, on, on this. Um, for bone fractures uh, specifically, um, I cannot think of anything right now how to do that specifically for that, but it's something that uh, one should sit down to, to look into, Re really interesting. I think it could be uh, uh, good in those cases where you ha don't have the time to 3D print something as well, and you uh, could like segment the part that you're interested in, and you can mm -hmm. just look at it in, in AR uh, yep. to see that uh, the size of it and how it looks like. Yes, uh, good point. It's like uh, trauma cases that you need to operate really soon on. Mm. Uh, still, it takes some time to, op to um, 
to do the segmentation. But anyway, I think uh, definitely good point. Yeah. Uh, Sassidar would like to have a brief explanation about the various ISO standards or compliances one should meet at various steps from scan to finished part. Uh, yes, um, the regulatory landscape will be discussed uh, in the fifth lecture. Um, so we just briefly try to answer it here. So um, it really boils down to what's the indicated or how how will the, the the print be used? Is it going to be used as a medical device? So like the molds? Then of course it needs to be it needs to be either C marked or um, if it's not only could be a model that helps the clinician or an educational model, then there's no CE mark required. Um, for models that are created inside the hospital, uh, we can use something that, like, that's called own manufacturer uh, uh, process. I will come to back to the lecture five. Um, if you need to have an ISO uh, a CE mark, then you have a, need to have a company organization that has um, ISO 1385 uh, certificate, uh, which is quality management system, quality management for uh, medical devices, um, and you need to have lot, lots of standard proced operating procedures on how to do uh, prints. So that's uh, more details to follow. Um, otherwise, there are not so many specific ISO standards for the printed parts. There are of course, biocompatibility uh, ISO standards. I will briefly mention those, but not going into detail in lecture five. Yes, uh, a question from Hannah. Uh, for complicated fractures, my impression is that these reconstruction surgeries uh, are, ne are never carried out super fast. They need to be discussed and taken care of by experienced orthopedic surgeons. One could therefore test if it would be helpful to have a 3D model. Have you considered to try this? Um, yes. So I, as, as I mentioned in the second uh, or maybe the first lecture, that really much more research is needed to show uh, efficacy of 3D printing. This is the typical example that you would like to do um, to um, to see does it does the 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 model add anything uh, to the actual treatment plan. So maybe a way of doing the such research is that first uh, the clinicians make a plan, then uh, they get access, uh, then write the plan down, then you get access to the model, and then rediscuss uh, the plan and see did they do any changes based on uh, on the um, the new input from the model. So that would be really interesting to to see. Um, research sometimes can be difficult. Right now we have a, we're thinking on how to do with the the molds that we're cranioplasty molds uh, where uh, we want to do a randomized clinical trial to randomize patients to either to use 3D printed or not uh, but then now we actually the clinicians are uh, not sure if how to do with this because the, it will be hard to recruit patients because all patients want to use the 3D printed molds because their end result is seems to be much better but we don't have any uh, formal uh, scientific publications to back it up yet with. Mm. So it's, it is a challenge of doing such research, but um, it's really needed and uh, yeah, so. Yes, uh, and there's also a follow-up question by Gabriel. Uh, when you have complicated fragmented fractures, how do you separate fragments from each other that are lying adjacent together? Yes, uh, so uh, Separating uh, parts that are adjacent to each other is, I mean, that's the, essentially the, the core of the segmentation challenge. So uh, there are some, there are tools for doing that in the software. Um, and the more together they are intensity and spatially, and uh, the harder it is. The, um, what I can say uh, is that sometimes you need to think of, do I actually need to separate them or not? Or is it just, uh, is it enough to print it and you really see the cracks and how they, how they look? Sometimes that's enough. And if you separate and you have another problem uh, that uh, the print will not stick together and will be fall apart when you use it, 
So different pros and cons. So sometimes we have when we have a printed fractured uh, uh, pelvis, for instance, uh, several cracks in it. Um, then we are we have not bothered to do this uh, separation to just print, and then uh, the clinicians has been happy with that because it's they can really see the, the, where it is anyway. Yeah. Have a, so, so, so it, this it, is like an example of it. Yeah. So the the I don't know if you can see it clearly, but there is a crack in the pelvis, but and this is probably separated these play different pieces of it. But when we three D printed it, we printed it as a whole piece instead. Exactly. So it's again boils down to what what's the internal vision that you put out for for, for the model, and um, yes. Yes, I think that's uh, all the questions right now. Um, I don't think the, there are any more. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent. So uh, next lecture will be uh, virtual planning and cutting guides. And do they do any difference? So it will be Peter Axelsson from Gothenburg that will uh, lecture this. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot for today. Yeah, thank you, everybody.